While I was in college, I had the joy of working at camp. Not our camp here at Warren Willis. This was the Presbyterian camp in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and I was their adventure director. I spent lots of time leading backpacking and canoeing trips, but what I did most throughout the summer was teach outdoor living skills to all the campers. If I was in the camp, I was teaching that at least an hour a day to each camper there. One of my favorite things to lead the campers in was a, a exercise in nature observation. Some of them called it the most boring 15 minutes of their life, and other people thought it was the most exciting thing they'd ever done before. And this is what we would do. We'd hike along one of our trails, and I would put them down individually in a spot, about 15 to 30 feet apart, and I would give them a clipboard, some paper, and two pencils, because if I gave them one, they would break one. And I would say, we're going to be back in 15 minutes. I want you to write down everything you see and hear. And if you don't know what it is or have a name for it, describe it with adjectives. And if you don't want to do that and you'd rather sketch it, make a picture. Draw a picture of what you see around you. You're not going to move for 15 minutes. You're not allowed to talk for 15 minutes. Just pay attention. And then I'd go off and set them off individually, repeating the same talk every time so that the last one would at least have heard it ten times before I got done with them. And I'd come back around after the 15 minutes, collect them all up, and we'd gather together and I'd say, okay, so what did you see? What did you hear? What did you notice? And sometimes they would tell me how excited they were. They, CJ, I never would have noticed that there was a line of ants crossing the trail carrying things. I never would have seen that toad or that frog because it was so well hidden if I hadn't sat still for long enough. And then there was always the one child who would say, that was horrible. Please don't ever make me do that again. And it would, the spectrum of all of those experiences would be every single time I did this. And those students, those campers, would begin to learn and discover that there was so much life and richness all around them if they would just sit still and listen. If they would shift their focus so they could experience these things. Now I realize that for those of you who know me, me speaking about observation and paying attention is kind of ironic because I'm horrible at it. I am not the one who will notice when you get your hair cut. I am not the one who will notice if you take a painting and move it from one wall to the next. I'm just not that person. And I haven't really ever been that person. You see, as a child growing up, we, my family would take trips. We'd take road trips to visit my dad's family in central Ohio. And as we're driving in our old Aerostar, like you know the wedge-shaped minivans that used to exist, we would be driving along and my dad would point out, there's some deer. And my brother and I would look out the window and, where? We don't see them. Or he'd go, look at that big old hawk up at the top of the tree. And we'd look, where? And we wouldn't see it because we hadn't trained our senses to see and pay attention. Whereas my dad, as a lifelong hunter, has trained his senses to pay attention to anything that's happening, especially where food is involved. But over the years, I've learned some of those skills. Now I'm the dad in the car that says, look, there's some deer. And my kids get to look and say, where? And I don't drive with my dad, so I'm, I'm now the first person to see those things. Because I've shifted my focus. I know what I'm looking for. I know where to look for it. I know how to find it when I'm out in nature or when I'm driving. And just as we can, I've trained these skills in myself and worked to train them in others regarding nature observation. It's also true for spiritual observation. We can see God and hear God and pay attention to the things of God if only we learn how. And friends, if I invite you now to, to take a pencil and a paper and write down 10 places you've seen God in the last 24 hours, reflect, how easy would that be for you? Where have, what are your God sightings 
this weekend. Well, I'm hoping that by the time I'm done with this, I will have given you some tool to help you figure that out. So that like those students at camp, you can sit still for a while and begin to experience and train yourself to hear and see what God is doing. And I think that's what Paul was trying to get at as he concluded his letter to the church in Philippi. You see, the scripture we, we, that was read this morning is near the end. It's our conclusion to this letter. This is a letter that was written from prison, and it's not the sort of prison that we think of. The prisons in the ancient world were often empty cisterns, and they were only empty for a little while, whether they had people in them or water. And so Paul was probably in the bottom of a cistern, which may or may not have had an inch of water sitting in there with him, in the dank, dark bowels under a building. When he wrote those words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. How in the world can he do that from a dark place? Number one, he can't write because it's dark, so he's probably dictating to someone he can't see this letter. But also, he has trained his senses to know where God is, even in the darkness. Even when he's chained to a wall in a cistern, he can proclaim the goodness of God. He can say to pray with prayers of supplication and thanksgiving to God so that you might experience the peace of God. And he can say that from the bottom of a cistern because he's trained his senses. He knows where to look and how to hear and how to experience God in all places, in all circumstances. Because not only do we believe that God is present with us at all times and in all places, but if we pay attention and learn to pay attention, we may begin to experience that truth as well. He's, he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy. Pay attention to these things. And friends, we must unlearn what we've learned in order to do that. Because we've had a lifetime of marketing executives and marketing plans and talk show hosts and late night comedians and everybody else teaching us the opposite of many of those words. We have to sift through everything we hear to find something that's true or even half true. We have to pay attention to people because we let voices speak into us and to us who are mocking others, who are celebrating injustice or ignoring it or saying it's just not real. We have to pay attention to the people and the voices we allow to inform us and shape our worldview. Because oftentimes those voices are people of ill repute who are quick to blame others for the, for the mistakes and the harm they've caused rather than own up for it themselves. This is the world we live in where we are constantly bombarded by these things that do not point us in the same direction. There's a story about a, a first people's chief, excuse me. <coughs> Mute then cough. There's a story about a first people's chief who was being interviewed by a reporter and they were walking down some busy streets. And the reporter's asking the chief questions, and the chief is answering the questions, and there's traffic going by, and there's people all around. And at one point, the chief stops. And the reporter keeps walking, and then turns back and sees the chief. The chief has stopped, turned toward a building, walked over, crouched right down beneath. The reporter comes over and says, what are you doing? He goes, I heard my brother Cricket, and I wanted to say hello. He says, how on earth did you notice that cricket in, with all of this stuff going on? And the chief says, I was paying attention. 
I can always find my brothers who are around because I'm listening for them. And this is what Paul is trying to teach the church in Philippi. And by extension, you and I, how to pay attention, how to hear and see and taste God's presence in our midst. Those of you who have smartphones, which I'm willing to bet is most of you, take out your smartphone. I've got mine right here. If you don't have a smartphone or you prefer not to use it, take out a pencil. I know they're in the pews and find a piece of paper. And those of you who are at home, if you're streaming from your phone, you're going to have to do this later. It'll be okay. Our Facebook page will have the image posted for you then. Take it out and make a note. Title it God Sightings. And then I want you to create some headings for yourself in that note. First one is true. Whatever is true or honest or unshakable, pay attention to these things. When you hear them, when you see them, when you experience them, make a note of them. Whatever is just, make that your next heading. Whatever is righteous. These are the things that are, are God-honoring, that are glorifying to God, that are pleasing to God. When you see those things or hear those things, pay attention. Whatever is pure or innocent or chaste, when you experience these things under this, make a note under this heading as a place you have experienced God, the pure, unadulterated laughter of a child fits there. Whatever is lovely or beautiful, type in that as a heading. Because in those moments, we experience God's presence and we experience the glimpse of heaven through the veil of this earth. You see that often through paintings or songs or a photograph. Whatever is admirable or commendable, things that you look up to, people you look up to, things you aspire to be like, when you experience that, make a note. Because God has met you in that place. Whatever is excellent or top-notch, that perfect dinner that someone served you, that beautiful, wonderful, excellent song, make a note. Whatever is praiseworthy or that thing that when you experience it, you can't help but sing along or celebrate it. Praiseworthy. And if I lost you anywhere in that note, go to Philippians chapter 4. The list is there. And why I wanted you to make that note in a smartphone or the thing that you carry around with you pretty much everywhere is because when it's with us and we experience any of those things, we can type in the note. I saw God. When that hawk came down and captured that squirrel that's been eating off my bird feeder all month. <laughs> Hallelujah, amen. I saw God when I saw that child skipping and jumping in the puddles. These are places God meets us every day and everywhere. If only we train ourselves to be aware of them. We thank God for meeting us in places like that. And just as I taught those campers to begin to be aware of everything going on around them in nature, so too can we begin to be aware of God with us. Everywhere and always. Now and forevermore. And in becoming more aware of God, we might be able to point out God to others. Did you see those people helping clear the rubble? 
at the collapsed condo in Miami? God was there. Did you see that person who went in and visited that person who was sick and in the hospital? God was there. Did you see that person singing up in front of you a beautiful song that I couldn't sing? At least not as lovely. God was there. God was there in the sunset and in the sunrise, whichever one you normally see, or both. God was in the rain. All of these things and so many more help us become more aware of the God who is with us so that we can point them out to others. So that like my dad driving down the road who could point out there are the deer so that as I grew, I might learn and do for my children, there are the deer. So too might you with the people in your lives. There's God. That's pretty cool. This is why we learn and grow so that others might learn and grow to love the God who is with us, the God of peace. And brothers and sisters, as we prepare ourselves for this celebration of communion and as we prepare ourselves to go out wherever we may go, I'm hoping that our senses and our awareness might better be tuned, that we might see God. In fact, that we as the psalmist might say, taste and see that the Lord is good. I've read the Yelp review. God is good and awesome, and his love endures forever. Hallelujah. Amen.